Okay, just a few more moments. I wasn't sure how long this would take, so I know some of you aren't done, but most of you are. And um, it's really just a, you know, a progress check to see what you remember. I know we had some time off there. It's a Tuesday after a weekend, things like that, so. Anybody, nobody? Okay, go ahead and if you pass those index cards across, I'd appreciate it. And the right column, go ahead and put them on the desks, thank you. All right, I'll join you with you because I don't have an answer key in front of me, so let's do these things together. I'll, I apparently need to go page 52 in my book for the periodic table. What is the full electron configuration for the element whose atomic symbol is Ti. That's atomic number 22, right? So if you drew a slant diagram, did anybody here use a slant diagram method? Or did you all go straight to the periodic table? Periodic table method? Okay, then let's just do it. So what's my first, I've got first energy level, right? How many electrons are in the first energy level? Two, and they're both in the S orbital, right? So I have one S, two, Pardon? 2s2. 2s2. Is it superscript or subscript? I always keep forgetting. I'm, I, I do it both ways sometimes. It's supposed to be, it's supposed to be, is it 1s2 or 1s2? 1s2 up? Okay. So then it's 2s2. It's like when I look at it in the book, I'm like, oh yeah, it makes sense. Of course. And then sometimes when I'm in front of class, maybe it's a little bit of nerves or something. If I saw it written this way, I would, I would know what was being communicated, okay? It's not technically right, but I would know what you mean. So 1s2, 2s2, what's next? 2p6. 2p6. So how many, or how many electrons are in the first energy level? Two, in the second energy level? Eight, okay? When I say how many are in the first energy level, you look for everything in the electron configuration that has a coefficient of one. That's all the first energy level. Second energy level, look for all the electrons that have a coefficient of two. We're not done though, right? So we go to the third energy level, three has two, then what? Three P six. Are we done with the third energy level? Okay, well, not really, right? Because now we go to 4s2. 2. And then 3d2. Okay. So if I were to ask you how many electrons are in the third energy level, it would be 2 plus 6 plus 2. 10. There are 10 electrons in the third energy level. But how many electrons are in the valence? How many valence electrons does this element have? Remember, the valence electrons are basically, I'm asking you how many electrons are in the highest energy level, right? What is the highest energy level up there? The fourth energy level, how many are there? There are two. It has two electrons in the highest energy level. It has two valence electrons. But because we have fill, we're filling the D, the 3D energy level after the 4S, we know that it's going to be acting weird, right? It's going to be acting differently than our very standard whatever column it's in, that's how, what charge it wants to take. Because this is not an A column, is it? It's located in transition metal. That's where you get into the weird behaviors. For most of the time, you're going to be forming molecules from the, especially ionics from columns one through eight A, all the A columns. Okay, what's the abbreviated electron configuration for BA? Well, that's real simple, isn't it, right? BA is down at the one, two, three, four, five, sixth energy level. Six S2 is its valence electrons. But to do the abbreviated, what, we, what do we do? Zach? Right, right, right. So we go back to the preceding noble gas, put that up there, and then we build from that point. And all we have to build after that is, again, one, two, three, four, five, sixth energy level, 6s2. Six okay. 
Any questions on the electron configurations? I mean, even if you missed it, do you, you understand it or remember it now? Okay. True or false, the octet rule states that all atoms want eight valence electrons. True or false? False. The octet rule says virtually all elements want eight. There are exceptions. I told you this exact question is always on the exam. The, the, the publisher always puts this on the exam. It's not true that everyone, it's not true that all. It is true that virtually all, but virtually is not the same. Cascade, the stuff you put in the dishwasher to t keep the spots away, why do, you, why do you think it says that it makes your dishes virtually spotless? Because there's going to be a spot every now and then, right? And if they claim that they're not going to let any spots happen and they happen, you're like, well, it's false advertising. There's a spot. It's virtually every spot. Here it's virtually all atoms. But we have exceptions, right? There's a few that want to fall back not to an eight, but to a two. They want to be like helium. Remember lithium, beryllium, those are exceptions. They want to be like helium. Other than that, everybody wants to be eight. Ionic molecules are held together due to opposite charges. True or false? True. True. Sin boldly, step out there. True. Yes. I would rather have you go false and be wrong than go true. <laughs> true. Remember, ionics, they give and take electrons. When they give and take electrons, they get charges. They get opposite charges. And when they have opposite charges, they attract one another like magnets. True or false? Left to right on the periodic table, the atomic radii increase. True. False. False. They stall all three. Remember, the radius increases top to bottom, but it's counterintuitive, and it decreases from left to right. That's why the trend is down and to the left. As you move to the right, the radius gets smaller. As soon as you go to the next energy level, boop, it's bigger again. And then as you move across, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller until, boop, gets big again, next energy level. So left to right, they increase. That is false. So give the formula for, the, for a molecule, or give the formula for tin 4 fluoride. Tin 4 fluoride. <coughs> so what does the tin 4 mean? Do you remember what Roman numerals mean? Anyone remember? Bobble, yes or no? Do you remember what the Roman numeral means? What does it mean? If you're going to say yes, you don't mean. It's just step out and tell me. What does it mean when you see an element with a Roman numeral after it? Yes, ma'am. Oh, you're reading it. Okay. It signifies the positive charge that that ion will have. In other words, it's telling me that tin 4 means if you find tin on the periodic table, remember tin looks like sin, right? So where are we looking at? I didn't look it up in advance, so I'm scanning right now. Number 50, right? It, has, it can make multiple ions. It doesn't just make one type. It can make more than one type. If I just said, what's the formula for tin fluoride, and I didn't tell you which tin we're talking about, there would be more than one answer you'd have to give me. Because tin can make up multiple. Matter of fact, we don't expect you to memorize every ion that tin can become, and so we give it to you. Kind of throw you the bone and say, okay, tin for fluoride means, first of all, tin is SN. The, the ion, the cation that tin will become will have a charge, right? It's a metal. It's going to lose electrons to become positive. But how many is it going to lose? Well, for tin for fluoride, it loses four. For tin two, it loses two to become a two positive. Tin four loses four to become a four positive. Now we have fluoride. We have a metal and non-metal, so we're doing an ionic molecule. Tin four fluoride. Fluoride, over, you know, periodic table again. Fluoride is the i name for fluorine. The symbol is F, column seven A, which means it, as an ion, becomes an anion that has what kind of a charge? It's column seven. 
So when it forms its ion, it becomes a what ion? What charge does it have? Negative. Negative one, right? You can write a one negative or just a negative showing us one. So tin four fluoride. I've written the, the, the notations for the ions on the board. Now, what is the combination for the formula? Remember the shorthand rule, the shorthand technique is to drop the signs and transpose as subscripts the numbers. That would tell me that this would be SNF4. Right? Another way to think about it is I've got one at four positive and I need four negative to balance that out. Each one is worth one negative, so I need four of them to balance out the four positive. So SNF4 is my formula for tin four fluoride. Yes? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I'll look at that if you. you oh, yeah. I mean, I still got it wrong. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And next one is MN MN two O three. Let me write this down and I'll clear the MN two O three. And like, do do do. Hello, computer. Oh, no wonder we're on freeze. Now let me go back and make sure that I am on the right slide. Let's unfreeze it. Boom, clears the board. Now I can see all my black markings and I can erase them. And we'll figure out what is the name of this molecule. Does anybody feel comfortable to walk us through how to name this molecule? Let me ask you, do you think it's covalent or ionic? Ionic, metal, non-metal, right? If you weren't really looking at it critically, what would you guess the name would be? If MN is manganese, right? And O is oxygen, which would make it an oxide, which would mean this would be something along the lines of manganese Oxide. <laughs> However, comma, do you think it's ever going to be really that simple? No. no, because manganese kind of falls out where on the periodic table? Oh, no. Manganese is a column 7B element. What does that mean? We've got to look out for multiple ions, right? The ion can take multiple forms. And so oxygen has one form. Manganese has possibly many forms. Hmm. So if manganese, if I have two of them at some unknown charge, well that would have to equal three oxygens at two negative, right? Doesn't oxygen have a negative two charge? And this would be the positive and negative. I gotta balance them out. So two times something equals three times two. So my something is equal to three, which means I have manganese three oxide. Okay. So you wrote Manganese, you wrote out phonetically three, or you wrote the number three, or the Roman number three. Or you put the oxide down? <laughs> <laughs> I will look at them all, don't worry about it. Okay. I thought I knew what I was saying. Yeah, I did too. Well, that's why we're doing quizzes, because you think you know what you're doing, but you need to know you don't before next Tuesday, right? Hey, I'm working on Monday. Before next Tuesday. I thought I was going to get 100. I thought everybody was going to get 100. So if you didn't get 100, I'm going to be thoroughly disappointed in you. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. 
Would you rather I expect 100 out of you or I expect you all to fail and get shocked when you pass? Which would you prefer? No. No. Wait, no? We're looking. All right, real quick review. Homonuclear diatomics. More than one word. Big words. Maybe in your language they all run together, but in mine, these are three different words. Homonuclear diatomic molecules. I know if you close your prayers in, in Jesus' name, amen. But that's actually in Jesus' name, amen. That's four words, right? Homonuclear diatomic molecules is homonuclear diatomic molecules. Same nucleuses, means they're the same elements. Two atoms forming a molecule. We said this is the most basic covalent molecules, and this is the way we need to understand how we're going to see the elements that are made up of molecules rather than individual elements naturally occurring. And we gave the homonuclear diatomics, they include hydrogen, and then the column seven, or it looks like column, it looks like a seven, oxygen, nitrogen, and then the column seven elements. Though they all, their atomic symbols are like this, in their natural occurrence in nature, we don't find individual atoms of any of these near each other. When two atoms are near each other, they immediately form molecules with another atom. So these are the homonuclear diatomic molecules. I said it's critically important. Every time from now on, when you're said, when, when it's said to you, for example, you have so many liters of hydrogen, the assumption is it's H2, not H. And the same for every other homonuclear diatomic. The naturally occurring form that you will find it in is in the homonuclear diatomic, not in a single atom, single atom elemental form. Okay? Because of these covalent bonds that are there, the covalent bond is that shared pair of valence electrons that holds the atoms together. And we said, so we've got a, a bonded pair, a shared pair or a bonded pair. We also have unbonded pairs. Remember when I drew the Lewis structures yesterday and I put two fluorines next to each other and they were, had, each had seven, so this applies to all the column seven elements, and they had seven dots around them and I brought the single dots towards each other and then I drew a line between them and said these two are now shared. That is a bonded pair. Around the Lewis structure, everywhere you saw two dots, two dots, two dots, those are referred to as unbonded pairs. They're not bonded to another atom. They're remaining with their original. So you've got bonded pairs and unbonded pairs now. And this thing we call a bond is the resulting connection between two atoms based upon them sharing an electron. Neither one of them is willing to give up any of the electrons they have. And they're continually trying to steal away the electron that's being shared. And since they're both trying to steal it away, they kind of both own it. They both count it as their own. And they meet their octet rule based upon shared electrons belonging to both. And that was part of yesterday's presentation. So if there's questions on that, um, really need you to go back over that. And this is the part where I know on the video there's gonna be a, a bounce spot right in here somewhere where it's really bright. And until we get the smart board up and working, I apologize, that's just the way it's gonna be on the video for a while. But this is where it starts to transition where I won't be able to use PowerPoint all the time because it frankly is just too much too much writing, or too much creation for the slides. There's, I mean, there's a lot of things that happen that I can do relatively quickly with a marker that would take me tens of minutes, if not halves of hours, to do with a PowerPoint. And it's not that I don't love you. It's not that I don't care, okay? It's just that's an in incredible amount of time to spend on each one of these slides for each one of these things that we have to discuss. And so in hopes that we can maybe even get a little bit better picture, I'm going to go ahead and kill the light up in the front. We're going to pick up on page 153 in the text. Page 153, and as I mentioned bef just, just now, as we had fluorine, we have two fluorines, and we oriented, these are kind of far apart, but I want to emphasize the point that these are two different atoms of fluorine. Each one has seven valence electrons, and when they're in proximity, they share this pair so that each one sees two. There's an unbonded pair, an unbonded pair, an unbonded pair, a bonded pair. This atom sees eight, so it feels its octet is filled. This atom sees two, two, two. That's three unbonded pairs. And a bonded pair, it sees eight, its octet is full. 
and this shared pair of electrons, they belong to both of them, and neither one of them is willing to give up either their own or the one that they're sharing with their neighbor, and they form a molecule. Now, they will, they will break apart, but it's going to take a lot of energy. It's going to take some force that's greater than the force holding them together to break them apart. And that's why when we have reactions with stuff like this, we've got to add energy to it. We've got to combust it. We've got to add some kind of, some kind of energy into the system that will override the energy that's used to hold them together in order to break them apart. Okay. They, they mention in the book next about this idea of, okay, we understand the Lewis structure for maybe these homonuclear diatomics, but we can also form covalent bonds with unlike elements. They give in here the case of carbon tetrachloride. We have on page 153 one carbon and four chlorines. Okay. And hopefully you'd recognize if we were to go through and draw the Lewis structures for all of these, carbon is in which column on the periodic table? It's column four, right? It has four valence electrons. If I do the Lewis structure for carbon, it looks like this. I have four electrons around it. Chlorine. I could do the same for all four of them. I'm just going to draw one of them to save time. It has seven, correct? It's column 7A element. So my Lewis structure for chlorine would look something like this. And that would be the case for all four of these. Now they're telling you that there is such a thing as a carbon tetrachloride. There is a CCl4 molecule. So given that there is such a thing, what is it going to look like here? Well, let me go ahead and erase this. I'm going to draw it again. And this time, I'm going to build the molecule for you in a two-dimensional Lewis structure. And then we'll go through how to build every two-dimensional Lewis structure for a covalent molecule. So here's what we're going to do. We have CCl4. What does it look like in two-dimensional space? And if I forget to say that everything I'm doing now is in two-dimensional space, we will, in the next module, move it into three-dimensional space. So it will take on another dimension of difficulty. But you've got to understand two dimensions to move to three dimensions, just like you really need to understand the Bohr model before you move into the quantum mechanical model. Okay? So understanding orbitals, understanding the energy levels like rings is important to understand S's and P's and D's and F's. In the same way, understanding this in two dimensions, then we just kind of modify it to take it into three dimensions. So we need to get it in two dimensions first. What we're going to do for a carbon tetrachloride, first thing I'm going to do is take the carbon and put it in the center. Symmetry, people would say symmetry in nature. I would say symmetry in God's character, God's design. Symmetry is everywhere. If symmetry is possible, generally it happens. Okay? If I look at the molecule and I've got one carbon and I've got four chlorines, it, does make, it makes sense to me now, and hopefully it will to you soon, and we'll give some chemical reasons why in a moment, but that the carbon would be in the middle and everybody else would be equally distant around it for symmetry. Okay. Now again, we're showing it in two-dimensional space. So what does that symmetry look like in two dimensions? Well, something like this. You see that? It's symmetrical. We've got the center. And we have four other things all equally spaced around it. And we show that for our eyes as being at the 3, 6, 9, and 12 o'clock positions. Makes sense, right? For symmetry's sake. Now, how many valence electrons does carbon have? We said it's a column 4A element. So it has four valence electrons. So I'm going to put the four valence electrons around it. We said that chlorine is a column 7A element. So it has seven valence electrons. And when possible, when we do this, we're going to orient the unbonded, or the, excuse me, the unpaired electron towards the unpaired electrons. So if I have seven, if I do this, and do the unbonded pair towards, or the unbonded electron towards the unbonded electron, guess what? If I do that in every case, Now, hopefully you can see that as we draw this, every chlorine has seven valence electrons, seven dots around it. 
The only carbon has four dots around it, which we know is the valence, the Lewis structure for every one of these elements, right? All we've done is kind of oriented it so that unbonded electrons are facing each other. How many total electrons are in this system right now? We have 7, 14, 21, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. There are 32 electrons total, right? How many electrons does chlorine see as drawn right now? How many does it see? Seven. It wants eight. Now how many does chlorine see? Eight. Have we added or lost any electrons? No. Same thing. Seven, eight. Seven, it sees eight. Seven, it sees eight. Here's the cool thing. Look what just happened. It had seven, it sees eight, it's satisfied. It had seven, now it sees eight, it's satisfied. It had seven, now it sees eight, it's satisfied. It had seven, now because of the bond and share, it sees eight. Look at carbon. Carbon had how many? Four. How many does it see now? Eight. The octets for all five of these atoms are complete. Have we added or lost any electrons? No. So we went from 32 electrons with f five dissatisfied atoms and by sharing, four, or sharing these eight electrons, we now have five satisfied atoms and still only have 32 electrons. And yet, every one of them is satisfied because their octet rule is now completed, is satisfied. These shared electrons represent the bond that holds this molecule together. And the angle between every one of these is 90 degrees because it's going to be perfectly symmetric. Now you don't have to draw those around there for when you draw the structure. I just want you to see mathematically I'm indicating these are all 90 degree angles. So that is just to help you see that fact, not that I expect you to put these 90 degree measurements in there because technically too this would be like this. I'm, I'm showing this is a right angle, it's a right angle, it's a right angle, it's a right angle. This is a carbon tetrachloride in two-dimensional space. This is as accurate in two-dimensional space as it would be if I took you up here and I pushed you into two-dimensional space. If I brought you up here and I squeezed you into something that was infinitely thin, would it really be you? No, it would be more like your shadow, right? But it would represent you, so people get an idea. Right now what we've got is an idea of what a carbon tetrachloride looks like. Next module, we'll take this and put it in three-dimensional space, and we'll go, ah, now I get it. That's what it really looks like. That's like we take your flat, go, shh, 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 blow you back up again, go, oh, that's what you look like. Okay, we'll do that next module. So if you turn over to page 154, they go through the process that you need to follow on every single construction of a Lewis, a Lewis diagram for covalent molecules. See, it says, first of all, count up the valence electrons in the entire module by adding up all the valence electrons of each individual atom. That's what we did. Seven, 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 four. Okay, we got 32. Good. What you're gonna need to do is when you're all done with all your little lines and your maneuvers and everything, count them up again and make sure you still only have 32. And you know, the best way to do that is to never add or remove a dot. Because when you make a bar, all you're doing is showing the share. You're not creating or destroying any electrons. So that's the first step. Second step. Put the atom with the most unpaired electrons in the center. So when we put this on the board at first, the carbon had four, right? Again, each one of them, carbon, chlorine. Okay. Which one of these two structures has the highest number of unpaired electrons? How many unpaired electrons does carbon have? Four. There are four unpaired electrons. How many unpaired electrons does chlorine have? This is an unbonded pair, an unbonded pair, an unbonded pair, an unpaired. It has one. So between four and one, which has the highest number of unbonded electrons? The carbon. The carbon is going to be your center. Your carbon is going to be your pivot atom. That atom, which has the highest number of unpaired 
electrons. They're not unbonded, they're unpaired. These are unpaired and unbonded. These are paired. This one's the only one that's not paired. So it has one unpaired electron. This one has four unpaired electrons. Basically, what we're going to be doing is looking for pairs. We're going to make pairs. This one needs it the most. Then symmetry tells me, ah, if it needs it the most, it needs four, and this one only needs one. Guess what? It's all going to fall into place. So count them up. Put the one with the most unpaired electrons in the center. Arrange the other atoms around the central atom and bond them with a single covalent bond, which we did. Now, they're not always going to, be, they're not always going to remain singles, but we need to start with singles. There may be doubles, there may be triples. But we're going to start with singles, and then we're going to count up the valence electrons and make sure that all the octets are full. Because that's um, So step three in the book says arrange them around the center, center and bond them with a single covalent bond. Then fill all the octets of the outside atoms. That's what we did. We put the unbonded pair. We made the one bond, and we simultaneously shared it and completed the octet. And when we were, when we were done completing the octet of all the outsides, we just do a quick check to make sure the octet of the inside is full, too just to make sure we got it all. Here's a hint, if it's done right, it's, an, it's a legitimate formula. When you complete the octets for the external atoms, the internal atom will be complete. Okay. And then lastly, make sure that the central atom has its octet. So look for the number of unpaired electrons. Whichever has the highest amount goes in the middle. Put the others around it, form single bonds, complete the external octets, check the internal octet. You're done. Obviously, that's a nice little process. It doesn't really start to make sense until we start to do some. So that's why you can, you can see now why making PowerPoints for all of these gets a little crazy. So I need to be able to talk and erase and write and answer questions. And the PowerPoint, you know, it may be something I could create after class, but not something that's really helpful before class at the speed we do. So the first one, the first question here, example 4, 5 on page 154, what is the Lewis structure for a water molecule? Well, water, dihydroxide, right? H2O, so we have a hydrogen, and a hydrogen, and an oxygen. How many valence electrons in the hydrogen? All together now? One. Hydrogen only has one electron. It's the first energy level, first column. One, one. What about oxygen? Oxygen is in column what? What's its column? 6A. So how many valence electrons does it have? Six. Which of those three molecules has the highest number of unbonded electrons? Or excuse me, unpaired electrons. That's the correct term. Which has the highest number of unpaired electrons? How many does hydrogen have? Has one unpaired. They both have one unpaired. This oxygen has two unpaired. So in a sense, oxygen is going to become my, my pivot atom. It's going to be the center of my construct. So I go ahead and put the oxygen here. Pair, pair, single, single. And now I have to place these two hydrogens somewhere. Where do you think they might go? Ma'am? next to the unpaired electrons, because we know ultimately we're trying to make pairs, right? So we put a hydrogen here, and we put this un unpaired electron towards the unpaired electron, and another one here with the unpaired electron towards the unpaired electron. Now we look at it and it says oxygen sees six, hydrogen sees one, hydrogen sees one. The first, okay, let's count them up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons total. So we're down to to eight electrons. It says, count them up, put the atom with the most unpaired in the center, surround it with the others, bond them together with single bonds. Okay, there's the unbonded pair. Guess what? Now they become a bonded pair. And they become a bonded pair. Fill the octets of the outside atoms. Fill the octets. Okay, the octet rule says that all atoms want eight, right? No. Hydrogen is one of our exceptions. It only wants two. How many does it see? Two. Is its octet rule satisfied? Yes, it is. 
octet rule satisfied. Let's use two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The octet of the center atom is satisfied. So in two dimensions, it's going to be different in three dimensions, but in two dimensions, these two are offset by a 90 degree angle, okay, in two dimensions. And this is a two dimensional Lewis structure for a water molecule. Now it does make a point in there on the page bottom 155 that there are multiple ways you could do this. As long as you have two unbonded pairs and two bonds to the hydrogen in two dimensions, there's multiple ways you can show it. In three dimensions, there's only one way we can really show it because we take into account the orientation of the molecule. So on your own, we've got five minutes. Let's walk through the on your owns together. We'll get into the more complicated structures tomorrow. Oh, by the way, before class today, you had, we had covered everything on the homework except for four problems. So it's not like we're, you know, you don't have what you need to do to get your homework done. Just so you're aware. Okay, draw the Lewis structures for the following mo molecules. Let's see, ammonia, NH3. SIBr4, silicon bromide, silicon tetrabromide, H2S, and I, 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 ICL. Okay, NH3, nitrogen and hydrogen. Are they a metal and a non-metal or two non-metals? You've got to ask yourself that question every time. Metal and a non-metal or two non-metals? The answer is? We're not going to get four done in five minutes if we can't determine whether nitrogen or hydrogen are metals or non-metals. Two non-metals, non which means what kind of bond do we have? Okay, a covalent bond, which means we're sharing, not giving and taking. Okay. Nitrogen. Well, we know hydrogen is a column one. It's going to have one unbonded pair or one unbonded electron or one, one unpaired electron is the way to say it. And nitrogen, column five element, right? So it has five. It's going to be, oh wait, one, two, three, four, like that, right? So I've got a pair and three singles. And here, in the hydrogen, hopefully you can see that I've got three singles, right? So I've got a pair and three singles, and I'm going to draw them with the singles. I'm going to note that I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. If I don't add any dots, and I don't remove any dots, if I just connect the dots, I'll be good. So hydrogen sees one, now it sees two. One sees two, one sees two. Their three octets are full. Nitrogen, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Its octet is full as well. We're done. SIBR. So we've got silicon, we've got bromine, right? Metals, non-metals, what are we looking at? Non-metals, non non-metals. So here's the deal. Look it. I have one and four. What do you think the symmetry is going to look like? Remember carbon tetrachloride? It was a c one carbon and four chlorines. Do you see that it's one silicon and four bromides? Same structure, right? I would anticipate that silicon is a column four element without looking. <gasps> oh, by the way, remember we said that silicon is a most like carbon and we speculate that life forms from other planets might be silicon based because we understand life is carbon based. If we pull the carbon out and stick a silicon in, it should basically work the same. Be a little different, but basically the same. So I have a silicon, which has four, and I know it's going to be in the center because of symmetry, and I know it's going to be in the center because bromine is a column seven element. It has one unbonded, one unpaired electron. Silicon has four. So I put it in the center. I put my un paired electrons, or I put my electrons around it. I take my bromine, they each have one unbonded, and I orient it towards the unbonded. Okay? 
They all see seven, all the bromine sees seven, silicon sees four. I have unpaired electrons towards each other. Now I bond them. Bond, 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 bond. Check the externals. Two, four, six, eight. Two, four, six, eight. Two, four, six, eight. Two, four, six, eight. Check the center. Two, four, six, eight. We're done. H2S, sulfur. Is sulfur a column six element? How did I know that? Well, because I've been doing chemistry for like 20 years. But on top of that, if I have sulfur with six and I have hydrogen with one, I can bond those and now they all have their octets full. And just, just to do, be it quick, what's iodine, what column? Seven, what's chlorine? Seven, right? So I've got iodine and chlorine. And the rock cuts are full.